Welcome everybody to Are You Ready to Garden? And tonight we are very pleased to introduce one of our uh, very best friends and colleagues from The Ohio State University, Dr. Gary Gal. And he's gonna be talking about growing delicious fruits and containers tonight. Rutgers Cooperative Extension uh, is an outreach portion of Rutgers, the State University and the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. So it's our privilege to uh, provide information to all of you and share the latest in research. And we're very fortunate tonight to have two experts with us, Gary Guell and Gary Pavlis. And they're both uh, tops in their fields in terms of small fruit production. Dr. Gary Guell is a professor and extension specialist with the Ohio State University. His research and extension efforts focus on blueberries, brambles, grapes, and other high value crops. Dr. Grau is the editor and co-author of the award-winning Midwest Home Fruit Production Guide. Dr. Gal is also a regular contributor to the American Fruit Grower Magazine. And I think everybody here knows myself, Bill Lubick with Rutgers Cooperative Extension, um, agricultural agent, Middlesex County professor, uh, teach classes at Rutgers State University and starting a farm and sustainable agriculture. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Gary Pavlis here with us too. And, and, and Dr. Gary Pavlis is an expert in all things related to blueberries and grapes and vineyards. And we're, we're very fortunate to have him at Rutgers State University here with us. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Gary Gow. And Gary, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks a lot, Bill. Uh, this is so, so exciting to be able to join uh, you know, give a presentation to folks, uh, you know, that far away. So I really appreciate that uh, introduction, Bill. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, growing, uh, you know, delicious fruits. And as you can imagine, that pretty much all fruits are delicious, and you know, I like them all. So fruits are very, very exciting to uh, exciting to uh, to grow, both uh, in the field and also in containers. So, uh, and this particular uh, talk kind of uh, is a result of uh, one of our uh, research projects. And, and I also, over the years, because I was a horticulture extension ed educator for, let's see, for 11 years. So it's always a lot of fun and, and really appreciate uh, uh, you all coming. You know, that's, that's amazing. A hundred, a hundred some folks and, you know, giving, giving up uh, your uh, precious time, so really appreciate it. Uh, go ahead, get started, and I kind of did a little quick search and to see where, you know, where you are uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of your uh, USDA uh, hardiness uh, zone, and uh, Ohio work uh, we're in zone six, so it looks like you guys uh, covered quite a bit of ground, you know, from five. Uh, zone 5B uh, to, uh, you know, Zone 7B. So that's a pretty good width uh, in terms of, um, you know, different zones and temperature uh, differences. So uh, with, with container, you know, container fruit growing and and uh, why do people do it? And, you know, uh, you know I, I always thought, well, it's fun. It's a lot of fun to do. And uh, and then the, probably the second question for gardener is uh, maybe for winter protection. And uh, so during the winter month or before it gets really cold, uh, you can actually uh, move your uh, containers, and, uh, you know, to a protected location, maybe like an unheated garage, uh, or you can avoid, uh, you know, poorly drained soil. Uh, we have a lot of the, a lot of the clay soil in Ohio, so if you were to grow things in containers, and you can, you can avoid that uh, problem uh, very easily. And uh, sometimes, sometimes people don't, may not have enough space, and so limited space is another one. And uh, I happen to do a lot of uh, research on uh, blueberries. Uh, you guys uh, have a very uh, well in New Jersey. It's one of the largest uh, blueberry uh, uh, production states. And, but for people who do not have acidic soil, you know, a container production would be a way to go. And uh, also sunlight, and, you know, we uh, sometimes uh, gardeners are kind of uh, always uh, call myself kind of a crazy gardener. And when you don't have enough sunlight and and I would tell people, well, maybe maybe you could grow, uh, grow things in containers and, 
you know, move that baby around, to, you know, in the morning, maybe get it to the sunny side and in the afternoon, just follow the sun. So, so that would be uh, another reason. And, and there might be other reasons because you can elevate them. So it's easier to pick fruits and, uh, and all that. So just lots and lots of good reasons. And we all hear about, uh, you know, antioxidants and eating a lot of, uh, you know, fresh fruits, uh, fruits and also exercise and doing stuff in the garden is a lot of fun. And uh, uh, another thing is the winter protection uh, in Ohio. Um, uh, in Ohio, because we're in zone B, I would say probably most of the time, maybe every other year or every third year, and our flora kings will be killed. So, you know, we don't have much of a crop. So container production is a pretty, container growing is a pretty good, good way to grow uh, some of the uh, tender varieties and like Washta, Natchez, and, uh, you know, those varieties from, from Arkansas. And, and, you know, they would typically not be cold hardy um, where you are. Winter protection is another, another one. And then uh, this is a picture of uh, iron chlorosis of blueberries. Uh, even though it's uh, showing, um, you know, kind of iron deficiency, but it's more related to higher pH. So we always tell people uh, you know, blueberries uh, would like to have a soil pH of 4.5, um, you know, 4.5 to 5.2, uh, but I would say 4.5 is more ideal. And so get around uh, the poor uh, soil conditions and, and then higher pH for blueberries. I remember even back when I was a graduate student uh, and uh, I used to work with, with professors and who worked on uh, dwarf rootstocks, and so when you have apple trees and grafted onto dwarf rootstocks, uh, you could put them in containers and and then keep them there for a long, long time, because the uh, trees themselves uh, uh, still for dwarf ones, uh, maybe uh, you know maybe uh, let's see, maybe six or seven feet tall, uh, or you could do the what's called the the columnar uh, type uh, of varieties. You see them in. Uh, in catalogs, and so you know, growing fruit trees in containers, uh, and that's always a lot of fun, and and should be could be done, uh, you know, with relative relative ease, uh, especially with these columnar, uh, they just look like sticks, uh, lots and lots of flowers, and and sometimes you have to uh, prune them really hard for them to produce any any uh, shoots, and they tend to produce so many so many flowers and uh, kind of overload themselves with fruits. And then another thing that you might want to do is uh, you could grow uh, you could grow things that are not really cold hardy in, in your area. Like I know in, in Ohio, we're kind of too cold for uh, pomegranates. And so, you know, that would be one, one thing that I always uh, kind of dreamed of uh, uh, growing in Ohio, being of an uh, Asian descent and I love pom pomegranates. But you have your own favorite fruits, and you know, for example, figs. You know, figs would be a very nice fruit to grow in containers. If you grow them in containers, you get you know, you kind of get a summer crop, and then you get a fall crop. So, so that would be pretty neat. With strawberries, boy, all there are all kinds of them. Uh, really, sky's the limit in terms of the type of containers. There are all kinds of uh, uh, containers and. You know, window boxes would be can still be called uh, a type of uh, container. There are many, you know, many different kinds depending on you know how you would grow them. Whether you grow them as as an annual crop or uh, as a perennial crop. You know, with window boxes, it's probably better to grow them, uh, you know, like a like an annual crop, and because during the winter months, if you're in zone five or zone six, uh, this much soil may or may not be able to, uh, you know, keep yeah, keep the roots alive. Those are the things to to consider. Talking about uh, being creative, uh, I, I'm sure a, lo a lot of you have seen the these uh, what's called the tire gardens. Uh, you know, just large and uh, you know really huge tires, and you paint them all kinds of colors. And, and you know, many of you have heard the uh, the Michelin com commercial. You know, because so much is riding on your tires. And, I thought, well, what the heck? So much more can 
ride on old tires here too. And you can grow all kinds of stuff in something like this. So kind of, you know, this is more like the basics of uh, container fruit production. So we're, we're going to talk, talk about media a little bit and, uh, and then uh, professionals would call them substrate. Uh, you know, scientists at USDA, and if you tell them you are using growing media, they will kind of poo-poo and, and, and probably tell you you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, they would call them substrate. So container and then media and then, uh, then watering, and for commercial guys, that would be irrigation. And then fertilization a little bit uh, may not really get into pest control very much. Before you get uh, get uh, started, when you when you look at all these catalogs and different containers, you know some are uh, kind of flimsy, cheap, and and these guys uh, uh, will probably last about maybe two three years. And you know we we bought a few because they're uh, they are cheap and about maybe two or three dollars a piece. And uh, I would say if you were to keep them uh, long term, uh, I wouldn't really use this because uh, they will get brittle and, and then they break. So I would say two to three years. And, and even though we have had them for about four to five years now, but when you try to move them around, sometimes these uh, containers could break. And then you have uh, you know, more uh, kind of a stronger, you know, stronger ones, a thicker wall. And, um, with lips, and those are really nice. The ones uh, you know, with a handle uh, on the side, and that's even better. And also, depending on the crop that you grow, uh, uh, we uh, we found out that uh, if you grow blueberries, uh, uh, instead of having really deep pots, uh, it's it's better to get the flatter ones and kind of uh, kind of squat looking uh, pots. So same volume, just flatter ones would be better for blueberries, but for everything else, maybe for fruit trees, and you kind of want to have a deeper roots, uh, maybe for raspberries and blackberries and kind of more uh, more wider and, uh, and flatter would be uh, better. Some of you may have seen these kind of claw type and, you know, kind of eco type uh, grow bags. I would say these are mainly good for strawberries and uh, a year or two and, and uh, I would say during the third year, they pretty much have broken down and they haven't really done that well for us. So I would say if you wanted to keep them for uh, for five or six years and you know perennial crops, and I wouldn't wouldn't use this. But for strawberries, two years, and, and that's not uh, that's not too bad. Containers maybe shape. Uh, actually, we are, we're all used to round uh, round pots, but it turns out actually. Uh, square ones are easier to work with because you can stack them much more easily. So I really de develop a strong, really love for 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 square pots. And, uh, another weird pot that uh, type of pot that we saw was uh, uh, some of you may have seen this, and uh, these are called air pruning pots. So if you grow anything in containers, and some of you uh, have seen uh, seen kind of circling the roots and and all that. Uh, and uh, to to minimize that, uh, and then see uh, these uh, uh, these air pruning uh, pruning pots. What they do is uh, they have these air holes, and so when the woods hit the wall, and then because of uh, you know because of the drought, while the uh, because of uh, you know lack of water, they would just stop growing, and and then you know some nursery nursery growers uh, instead of doing this, uh, they used to paint. Uh, you know, paint uh, the inside of the containers with uh, copper sulfate. You know, that's one way to stop it. But this is kind of expensive, uh, depending on where you get them uh, from. And some will probably cost about fifteen, and then others will cost about thirty-five. So, so as you can tell, this this particular homeowner uh, really went to town. You know, uh, with it, and four of them here, and and then four of them there. So uh, you know you can grow a lot of things uh, on your uh, on your deck, and uh, well, the New Jersey may or may not be known for for moonshiners, and uh, but uh, if you happen to be happen to be a moonshiner, and this is one way to utilize your whiskey barrels, so you know you can cut them in half, or you can do what this guy did, and boy, cut them into uh, into different uh, different tiers and. 
then you have the little terrace for strawberries, and so it's it's a really a lot of fun, and uh, you know people have, have all kinds of creative ideas. So for most perennial crops uh, like blackberries, raspberries, and and uh, blueberries, I would say um, uh, ten gallons. Uh, ten gallons would be kind of a minimum. Uh, just getting older, and it's hard to move things around anymore. And and I have. I'm gradually develop, developing an, an appreciation for for things that could be mobile for gardeners who who kind of enjoy uh, maybe less you know uh, less backbreaking work. So you could put the containers on a cart and and then like this guy, like this little cart here and little wagon thing. And so you put on them and and then you can wheel them around so you don't have to carry them and and so that would be. Uh, ergonomically, uh, really uh, good uh, for everybody. The next thing I, you know, you would kind of have to decide would be growing media or substrate. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of factors to consider. Well, the first one is the diseases, and uh, you know, with greenhouse operation, and we all know that uh, you know, you uh, uh, for uh, annuals. Uh, uh, folks would uh, steam sterilize uh, their potting mix, and while well, that will kill a lot of um, uh, diseased organisms, and it will also kill potential weed seeds too. So that's always a good good thing to have. And then another thing you need to keep in mind is uh, whatever media that you purchase, you need to make sure the pH is uh, at the right level. Uh, most of our uh, crops uh, kind of enjoy a slightly acidic soil, which is 6.5. So I know what we have used 100% uh, aged pine bark, and that pH is about 4.6. And so we had to add lime, a certain amount of lime to, to get it to a 6.5. And then uh, because potting mixes, some might come uh, with fertilizer and others might come with uh, maybe hydrogel to for water retention. So you you kind of need to know that, and uh, because you will you know you will be unlike the natural soils and these uh, growing media, uh, you have to provide uh, all the water and nutrients unless there is some already in there. And then the one great thing about uh, about container production is you get great drainage. And uh, also uh, lightweight, while well, lighter weight. You really don't want to uh, put any natural soil in there because you are going to introduce uh, potentially uh, disease-causing organisms. So I would use 100% soilless media. And then one thing you kind of have to worry about is, uh, well, how long would this media last? You know, that's if you want to keep your plants in there for five or you know five or ten years. And what we found out was uh, just our good good old age, the pine bark, the loblolly pine bark from the paper industry. So far, after five years, and it's still still looking pretty good. So if you just use some uh, peat moss and other other perlite and uh, vermiculite, and peat moss can disappear quite quickly or decompose very quickly. So. You need to keep in mind that uh, you know select the media that will last a long time. So, what kind of media do you do you choose? Gardeners may not have the luxury of uh, you know ordering you know a semi truck load, and which is what we did. And, but you can still purchase aged pine bark from garden centers. So, so a really a, a very good mix. It's about a 80% pine bark, 10% uh, peat moss, and maybe 10% sand. So, so the you know pot won't wa wobble around. Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of uh, you know that's a typical typical mix, and and then you can get uh, kind of go crazy from there, and you know uh, designing all kinds of uh, you know different types of media and uh, different combinations. And uh, what what we do know is that you, you definitely do not want fresh pine bark. You want aged uh, aged pine bark and. And then you you can also go with the you know the Cornell mix, and uh, so this is uh, you know it's a complicated uh, you know complicated formula, and uh, but this is more designed for for uh, commercial nursery nursery guys. And then once you do that, then you will definitely need to add uh, you know add lime to adjust the pH to six point five. 
because if not, then plants will kind of suffer. And uh, I always like pictures, and this is uh, uh, one of our one of our piles of, of our aged pine bark. Uh, it's kind of a sustainable source, and as long as we make paper from trees. And just uh, since this was, was part of a research project, and I thought that would show off our our container, uh, you know, uh, our plants in containers in the background, and you see uh, both the raspberries and, and the blackberries in containers. I would say if you were to grow raspberries and, and the blackberries in containers, and uh, those are easy. We didn't know much much about the uh, container production before we got in the, into it, and we talked to a couple of specialists. Our blackberries and raspberries just took off uh, during year one, as soon as we got uh, the pH and adjusted to 6.5, and and then we added uh, slow release fertilizers, and so it was very, yeah, very very easy. Other than uh, strawberries, and that might be one one crop that, crop that I would start out with. This is another picture, uh, another picture, and this came, came from one one of my uh, friends, uh, Tom Anderson. Yeah, he told me, oh, Gary, it's it's uh, a raspberry production. Oh, it, it's easy. Uh, well, from you know, from the pictures that he had, man, it's just loaded with fruits. So if somebody is thinking about doing this, and probably the ever-bearing varieties will be uh, will be the preferred. Uh, uh, type and so you can have a you can have a late uh, spring early summer crop and you have a fall crop so it's a fantastic way to, to grow uh, raspberries and also there are a few specialized varieties uh, uh, one of the those uh, you know my spelling is always kind of rough it's called kawali uh, i think it's, i think it's k w e l i something like that it's well designed for uh, container production so that would be, uh, you know, what I would do. So the next thing is, uh, you know, once you get uh, soil uh, pH adjusted with lime, and uh, and then what about fertilization? And for us, uh, uh, for commercial growers, and what what they do is, uh, and you know, they would buy these uh, large bags, uh, large bags of uh, you know fer fertilizers, uh, you know, same like you know Scotts. Uh, um, it's one of those uh, uh, one of those companies that produce a lots and lots of different types of fertilizers for for gardeners, for greenhouses, greenhouse growers, uh, and uh, flower growers. Uh, so if you couldn't you know find these uh, in large bags, and act, we actually had trouble with getting them because uh, when we purchased them, we didn't really want to get one pallet full. You know, we we just wanted a few bags for research, uh, so that was actually pretty hard. And so, but the smaller, uh, smaller bottles from uh, from your local garden centers and, and or home stores and like this and, and will do. So the main thing is to find out what, uh, you know, what the nutrient levels are and you know these screen numbers. It's actually important to to make sure the fertilizer has uh, has both major nutrients and this would be N, P, K, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And it's also important to make sure that uh, these things have uh, micronutrients. And so, so I just kind of put this picture here. You see Osmocote Plus, and so you have micronutrients. So for for our research, and we actually bought, uh, you know, bought uh, uh, bought the Top Stress Special with micronutrients. Uh, we also added Micro Max, which is another kind of super pack, and to make sure. Uh, our bushes and you know get uh, plants get enough uh, nutrients and this is kind of what uh, uh, what we used and it turns out the rate was really not that uh, not that difficult to figure out when you check out the information online actually they have these some um, product sheet and, and it will tell you the exact amount uh, even though it's in grams which is kind of not that convenient uh, but for scientists uh, that's actually more uh, more accurate for us. So you figure out if you know the size of your container, and then you you know the type, and and then it will tell you tell you exactly how much uh, you can you can apply. You can apply as a as a broadcast on the surface. That's one way to do it. Or you could incorporate uh, fertilizers into uh, into the mix. Uh, you know that will 
you know, that will uh, help as well. And, and then they have these, uh, you know, conversion factors, and, you know, one teaspoon, um, you know, six grams, just a tablespoon. So it's pretty nice. And uh, so that's a good news. <laughs> the, the bad news is uh, they have different formulations. So when you look at the, you know, a little, little baggie and, uh, or a little, a little bottle of the fertilizer, and some are designed for three months, and some are designed for six months, and some are designed for eight months. So I would say uh, for most of us, um, you know, three months or, or six month formulation would be pretty good. So you can gauge, uh, you know, how, how fast the plants are growing. And then plants are really not that picky, it turns out. Blackberries and raspberries. Boy, blueberries were really picky. Uh, uh, and I, I have a feeling that uh, the blueberry bushes really hate us. So really, if they had any feelings at all, we our first year was a disaster and took us a long time, took us a year to figure out what we were doing with blueberries. So just uh, you know, in terms of uh, raspberries, uh, you know, there are a few varieties and, and I think Kowali uh, was uh, one of the best. Or you could grow things like Heritage, Caroline, you know, those are all, all fine too. Or you could grow whatever variety that you like, even even the summer bearing varieties, and uh, they could be uh, really good. AC Eden is a newer selection, and we uh, we like it quite quite a bit. We also like Nova in Ohio, so you can uh, tulumi is a little bit uh, a little bit old, and so some people, put, a lot of people like like it, uh, and then the heritage is older, and you know people. Uh, you know, people love, still love it. And if you if you hate thorns, Joan Jay doesn't have any thorns, so I would say that would be a good choice too. And yeah, this one has a lots and lots of information. Probably the take take home messages uh, we did add quite a bit. Uh, you know, quite a bit of lime, you know, dolomitic uh, lime to be exact, 144 gram to to get the pH to about 6.8. And I just happened to uh, conduct another project, and again, uh, you know, we were uh, looking for looking for funding and running out of ideas, and thought, well, maybe I'll I'll do one uh, do one on super berries. So we grew Chinese uh, goji berries, and uh, Chinese goji berries can be easily grown in containers. It turns out that uh, Chinese goji berries, the varieties that we have, you know, in the states are not very good. The Crimson Star and uh, Phoenix uh, tears, uh, and they don't taste really good. Well, the ones uh, that are grown in China, uh, folks uh, have actually uh, did, uh, uh, did cross-pollination between, between goji berries and cherry tomatoes, and uh, they develop much larger fruits and much sweeter fruits. And so if you are thinking uh, why, why your goji berries don't taste good, it's the variety, it's not you. Uh, the ones we have kind of taste kind of pepper, peppery and they don't really taste that great, unlike the ones I got from Chinese grocery stores. So the goji berries are related related to tomatoes uh, in a solanaceous family. Uh, there really aren't any good ones yet. And, and Crimson Star might be might be the best, but it's still kind of kind of very mediocre. How would you describe the flavor of the ones that you would recommend that have excellent flavor? What what do they taste like? Because uh, of my Chinese descent, uh, when I when I uh, buy goji berries and goji berries come in little packets, uh, and uh, they are dried goji berries, uh, kind of like sun dried tomatoes. When when I put them in hot water, kind of making tea or soup, they taste really sweet. Somewhere between sun-dried tomato and the raisins, all the varieties that we tested in Ohio, they taste like green peppers to me. <laughs> so, some people were asking about what you know. What do they have to be concerned about in containers that need pollinators? So if you could just go over that, pollinators, and that's always a, a kind of a hit hit and miss. And if you leave them, you know, leave them outside, uh, you know, wide open. Uh, with our container yard, we didn't really have any honeybees, honey beehives, uh, beehives around. We do have maybe two hives, and, you know, kind of a several, uh, several hundred, maybe five, maybe a thousand feet away. So pretty far. So they still get enough uh, pollination. So 
So if you wanted to, and if you wanted to make sure there is a pollination, you could be your own kind of favorite honeybee and get a little camel brush and, and then, uh, uh, you know, pollinate, like, pollinate them like that. And we, you know, we did a research project on, on figs too. If you grow figs in hardy Chicago and uh, brown turkey, and they don't need uh, insects for pollination. Uh, they just uh, produce fruits without any pollination. The other, you know, other figs, and uh, uh, you know, they need this kind of specialized wasp. But uh, uh, hardy Chicago, a Chicago hardy, and the brown turkey, uh, they could just produce fruits without uh, any pollination. So I'll go over some, you know, maybe strawberries, and to get you guys all kind of drooling a little bit, uh, and love and just love strawberries. Uh, I know, Bill, you guys um, have developed quite a few fantastic varieties and very sweet varieties. And, and uh, yeah, Bill even sent me a few plants for testing. And, and then just very quickly, disease resistance. Uh, and then maybe three, you know, uh, well, strawberry types, uh, you mainly have three, uh, three different types. Uh, for container, you know, container grown uh, strawberries, I would grow either the either ever bearing or or day neutral, and and some people kind of just treat them the same, you know, just call them all everbearing varieties. So, because the good news about everbearing or day neutral is, uh, and these guys, uh, you know, produce uh, fruits and, uh, during the first year. So when you put them in containers, you will get fruits during the first year. And I always use this picture to remind me about uh, root rotting diseases. And, but if you grow them in containers. That may or may not be, uh, you know, that big of a deal uh, because you have perfect drainage or nearly perfect drainage. If you have an, if you have enough patience and it, it grow them in containers one year and then wait, you know, get fruits next year, you can still grow some day neutrals, and, you know, early glow, Annapolis, and short crop, and red chief, and late glow, or you grow grow varieties that. Uh, Bill and uh, your colleagues uh, developed, and they are much, much, much better than these guys. But if you ha happen to be looking for ever-bearing varieties, uh, uh, two several varieties that I know, they are Ozark Beauty and the Quinault. You know, these are um, pretty good selections. And then you can select uh, uh, the neutral types too, and there are a whole bunch of these uh, available. So. So you uh, you know the ones uh, that have been around for a long time, TriStar, Tribute, uh, planting time. Typically, it's about uh, actually about now. You could probably plant them tonight. And one thing to remember is when you plant strawberries, uh, only cover half of the crown. Uh, otherwise, uh, they will they will not uh, do very well. And and in the field, you, you use a lot of mulch, straw mulch. Uh, but when you when you grow them in containers, uh, and uh, nursery guys use uh, rice hull, so weeds uh, will have a hard time, uh, you know, germinating in that. And so the weed seeds could still germinate, but they will dry out and may die. So if you can get a hold of them, that would be great. And if not, the straw uh, would be, uh, you know, may not be as uh, nice looking, but still works very well. I would say it still looks great. And I use this uh, picture to kind of remind me uh, about uh, pollination and, and uh, or frost control. So, so both. And, and remember that uh, strawberries and you know, on the on the flowers, and you see these uh, individual florets, and uh, every single well, just about every single one of these needs to be pollinated to ensure perfect pollination. And uh, you, you know, you could, uh, like I mentioned, uh, you know, you could be your own honeybees and go around and use camel brush. Uh, but we also found out that uh, 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 with strawberries, uh, we could also uh, use a, a leaf blower and uh, put it on low setting, because if you get it on high setting, you high setting, you might uh, you might blow your planters away. So, uh, or some, you know, the uh, hair uh, hair dryer, but that's going to release heat. So no heat and just let the let air out. And uh, so we found out that was a pretty good way to 
to pollinate our, our strawberries. And we could even, we even do, do that inside the greenhouse. And then another weird thing is uh, uh, we found out the, the perfect time to, to use the leaf blower to, to blow the flowers for pollination. It's uh, somewhere between 11 o'clock uh, to about two. And that's when the uh, pollens are not that wet. So you could blow them and you know they can uh, spread pretty easily. So, so if you were to act as your own honeybee and just remember 11 to 12 o'clock to, to do that. Gary, if I can add too, um, we, we've, we've done some of these uh, day neutral uh, strawberries. And as you said, Ozark Beauty, Tribute TriStar is sort of the old, old generation. But uh -huh. um, we've tested, for instance, Seascape, uh, Albion, Cabrillo and Portola, but Seascape, uh, they're all really a uh, whole nother ge generation better. Um, and these, they're really pretty, pretty good tasting, I got to tell you. So um, if somebody wanted to do those day neutrals, I'd go for Seascape and Albion for sure. Plus, um, Dr. Ed Derner from Rutgers is doing work where he's interrupting the, um, the dark cycle of strawberries in the evening. Oh, and just with one one hour of interruption of light, you can actually take certain varieties of even June bearing strawberries and they will produce again. So we're doing those tests right now. Oh, and wow. we'll have all that information released very soon. And you know, I mean the beauty for homeowners is that these these day neutrals will um will continue to flower and fruit the whole season. And, uh -huh. and that's that's uh -huh. really that's really a real plus. So if you were to grow uh, blueberries and it looks uh, in containers and it looks pretty easy because uh, you know you, you think like okay well the you know the ph is already there at uh, 4.5 we went to the school of hard knocks and you know this uh, look, looks easy and, and this is when our project and uh, initially looked like and, and then we uh, added uh, you know nutrients and added uh, mi micro macro and and uh, thought well this is you know, how complicated can it be so, so it was very, very complicated. So lots and lots of yellow leaves, even though the pH was perfect, uh, perfect, and they looked like this and very depressing. And after one year, we figured out that it wasn't just the soil pH, and it was also the irrigation water that's very high in alkalinity. So you kind of learn from, you know, from our mistakes. So make sure you, you test your irrigation water. They don't. They don't really come out like this. And I think this. Uh, they uh, maybe they they do. And that would be uh, in Oregon, uh, Oregon or California, uh, not not in Ohio. Maybe they do that in New Jersey. Uh, and looks like my time is kind of uh, kind of up. People were asking about the grow mix. So I don't know if you want to go back to that slide for grow mixes that would be almost ideal for most of the plants that we're growing in pots. Uh, that would be 80% uh, aged pine bark, 10% you know, peat moss, and the 10% sand. And that would be a pretty good start. You know, I said when you're starting stuff, you can start it in a pro mix or sterilized potting mix, but then you want to have that combination mix when you're growing the plants for long term. Yeah. You know, um, so that really works best for them. And then yeah. in terms of pruning of some of these plants, what would you recommend just as a general guide for blackberries and raspberries for pruning in containers? Actually, it turns out that uh, uh, the, the plants in containers are, behave pretty much the same way as those in the field. They just grow taller. And uh, so, so the uh, see, but with blueberries and first maybe even three years, and we didn't have to prune them at all. We we would just remove the flower buds uh, during the first year, and then some. Uh, I think we may have even done that during the second year for them to give you know to give them a chance to grow. And uh, blueberries, we would just remove the little you know twiggy, kind of a dinky little uh, shoots, and let the bigger ones. Uh, produce fruits and, and raspberries and, and because they were ever bearing varieties. So we constantly uh, uh, had uh, uh, both um, primocanes and fluorocanes. 
So you, after the fluorokines produce fruits, you would just cut them off at the base and you let the, let the new canes come up. So it's a constant renewal process. So in containers or in the field, the process is the same. And then blackberries and uh, in these large containers, uh, I would say um, uh, three to four, uh, four fluorocanes uh, would be about right uh, because they can produce a lot of fruits. And these, these canes, uh, once they reach about uh, maybe five and a half feet tall, we would top them and, and then let them uh, grow laterals. So, and then the laterals, we would shorten them to about a foot in, uh, in March. Yeah, that, that's great. And so, so I'm just kind of going through, uh, you know, going through a few, a few pictures, and this is what they look like. And you know, during year one, very, very disappointing and and really sickly looking. So this uh, this picture here, I just wanted to show you guys, uh, you know, to kind of think outside of the box. And uh, even though most containers are round. And uh, when I first saw these square ones, I was like, what the heck? And, you know, what, what are these guys? And uh, once we got a few, and boy, I love them. They are so much easier to stack and so much easier to move around. Just perfect. So, so we may not really, in the future, we may not want round ones. They're much easier, much easier to do. And, and for, for commercial growers, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, with the with the blueberries, and we figured out after we started injecting sulfuric acid, and uh, our blueberries and started growing like crazy, and this is uh, what they look like, and you know during the year two, and, and uh, this is what they look like during the year three, and uh, we also found out that uh, uh, the the cultivar that we tested, the main cultivar was Draper. Boy, that was a that was a pain. That was a pain to grow. Uh, it's kind of a uh, it didn't really grow very well. Uh, didn't grow very much and very short, and very little growth. Uh, and uh, we found out by accident uh, uh, these uh, northern and southern southern high bush hybrids, uh, high bush uh, uh, sweetheart. Yeah, easier to remember. Easy to remember my little sweetheart. And uh, so we loved Sweetheart, an, an early variety. And we also loved Nelson. It just took off and without us trying very hard. And uh, I also have a feeling that, uh, you know, our acidified water was kind of uh, help, you know, helping too. But uh, Sweetheart and, and uh, Nelson, they were much better, uh, much better varieties for container production. And uh, if you are thinking about uh, winter storage, uh, uh, I assume Bill's garage looks like this, and uh, winter storage. And I just wanted to show you, show you, show you guys a picture of what we do. And this is, you know, designed for commercial growers, but for gardeners, I would say unheated garage that would be the way to go. And another way we tried it was uh, we actually uh, built raised beds and, and dug holes in the raised beds, and then we sank the. The containers into those holes, so the soil would insulate the insulate the pots, and, and uh, that actually worked out uh, quite well. So we won't have to move or move them around. If you just leave the pots all exposed during the winter month, um, because um, you know plant roots don't really have tr a true dormancy, so when it, whenever the weather gets warmer and they will just start growing, and then then cold temperatures will just hit them, so you can lose a uh, Loose plants quite easily. I think this might be my my last one, and just summary: just a lot of fun to grow. And make sure you get a large enough container. Ten gallons is kind of a min minimum for perennial crops. Smaller containers might be okay for strawberries. Thank you very much, because that was very informative. You fit a lot of information into one hour. And we greatly appreciate it. if anybody wants to uh, find out about the some of the strawberry varieties that we have developed at Rutgers. We have a brand new one out this next year called Rutgers Delight, uh, D and then L-I-G-H-T. I believe it's going to be available through one of the nurseries online, but if you contact us, uh, we will get you contacts for that to be able to get a hold of it. 
We also have Rutgers Scarlet um, and Albion, as, as Dr. Gary Pavlis mentioned, is a great uh, day neutral variety along with Seascape and Portola and, and the varieties that uh, Dr. Guao mentioned tonight. Gary Pavlis, do you have any final words for us too as well? You know, I was just, uh, when Gary was mentioning about uh, blueberries, um, you know, I, I mean, I think one of the great things about growing some uh, blueberries in the home garden um, or in containers is that um, there are so some so many that are fantastically flavored that are much better than anybody has ever tasted up till now. Um, you know, uh, one is called Elizabeth. It's, it's considered the best tasting blueberry, and it's named after Elizabeth White. Uh, from New Jersey here who, who actually invented the blueberry industry. And uh, you can get that from local uh, nurseries in New Jersey. But we've also just released, uh, you know, Raz uh, from the Blueberry Station. It's kind of a, a raspberry tasting blueberry. Um, so there are, there are some great varieties uh, that are out there that um, will far blow away anything as anybody has tasted up till now. So. I really encourage people to try to try to uh, grow them either in containers or in your in your backyard because uh, um, they are fantastic. I just also wanted to mention that um, right now in a study we're also applying with, with the strawberries just a little bit of extra calcium and boron and magnesium, and we find the berries do a little bit better when uh, they have that uh, in the mix. That you'll you'll see a little bit stronger berry throughout. And um, I will have the results to all that research at the end of this year, but you get less cracking if you uh -huh. have consistent calcium. Dr. Grau, we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with all of our listeners today. Um, we had a great turnout tonight uh, with the program, and it's because we have people like you sharing your expertise and, and Dr. Gary Pavlis that we're proud to have our colleagues at the end New Jersey Ag Experiment Station with us. If you're looking for different farms in our area, we have a great website, it's tinyurl.com backslash midco grown, and you can find all the farms in Middlesex County, what they offer, and you could use this little handy dandy QR code here to upload the map on your phone. And this is a really great resource if you wanna go pick your own pumpkins, Christmas tree farms, and things like that within Middlesex County. Also, uh, the Master Gardener Program. If you're interested in joining us, uh, we're hoping to have a program starting this fall. Uh, the Master Gardeners are a volunteer training program. And so if you're interested in volunteering and reaching out to the public on environmentally sound horticulture, then this is, would be a great program for you. So if you're interested, you can email the Master Gardeners at mastergardeners at co.middlesex.nj.us and let them know that you would like to be put on the email list for the Master Gardener program. And also, if you have any questions on growing leafy greens or vegetable growing in your garden or anything like that, you could also email the Master Gardener helpline. It's that same email address, mastergardeners at co middlesex.nj.us and we'll get back to you with some answers. I want to thank all of my guests tonight and I wish everyone a very healthy and happy week and we'll see you next week on Are You Ready to Garden? Take care everybody.